What's up, everybody? I'm the Goji Ryu philosopher, and even though my haters like to call me a girl, I'm still built as tough as any man, or at least any lean man who runs long distance. Recently, I've fallen down the rabbit hole of looking at women's self-defense techniques online. One of the most time-honored traditions of martial arts schools is throwing women's self-defense seminars, where a dojo will teach the simplest and easiest techniques to keep women safe from attack and assault, as a way of introducing the community to martial arts, and as a way of recruiting new students. However, if you're a fan of Ramsey Dewey or Icy Mike from Hard to Hurt, you probably know that the techniques that get called women's self-defense are completely useless, folding and becoming unusable under even the mildest pressure testing. Occasionally, I'll come across these infographics that show these kind of techniques step by step, but if you think about them for more than, like, five seconds, it becomes clear that they're, at best, ineffective, and, at worst, actively harmful to the people who would be relying on them in a desperate situation. Now, sometimes women's self-defense classes will just teach regular self-defense techniques, which is a separate matter. But there's a trend of self-defense techniques that are specifically marked for women being completely fantasy-based. Strangely, however, there doesn't seem to be a similar trend for other groups that might face violence and discrimination. Discussions of self-defense and race seem to focus more on the legal and ethical challenges of defending oneself when you can't count on the police to help you, or when they might even be the people that you're defending yourself from. And for LGBT self-defense, most of the conversation seems to focus on preventing being attacked by avoiding dangerous situations, including advice about avoiding certain types of partners who might lash out in shame over sleeping with someone. For some reason, it's only women's self-defense that seems to be heavily overrun with McDojos, fake techniques, and bullshito. So this time, I want to take a look at not just how women's self-defense is shitty, but why so much bad martial arts techniques get lumped in under women's self-defense. And how come so much of this terrible self-defense never gets challenged by actual female martial artists and fighters? Let's get into it. Alright, first things first, we gotta cover the two main ways in which women's self-defense techniques get taught. The first of these is low-resolution infographics that most people scan through in their Twitter feeds and promptly forget. But the second, and the most common one, the one I want to focus on, is the Women's Self-Defense Seminar. Seminars and special events for dojos are almost always, at least to some extent, recruitment activities. With the exception of events that are members only, which are usually the dojo inviting a special guest, the only reason that a dojo would spend money hosting a special event is as a way of advertising and getting new recruits. Since martial arts schools are expensive businesses, like any business, and also since students often take short breaks that they never end up returning from, it's important to recruit new students semi-frequently if you're hoping to keep your doors open as a dojo, and self-defense seminars are some of the best advertisement that there is. Rather than simply seeing your school's billboard or watching their demonstration, participants in seminars are getting physically engaged, and even if they don't remember the exact techniques that they learn, they'll be more likely to remember the event itself the next time they make a New Year's resolution to get in shape. And, well, self-defense is interesting to everyone, unlike, for instance, a kata seminar, which is probably only going to be useful if you're a current student. The problem, though, is that techniques in a self-defense seminar have to be short, simple, and able to be fully taught in a short period of time. Most participants won't come back for the next seminar, and might not be coming in to practice what they've learned in detail. You don't really have time to talk about all the strategies or the most common types of attack, or even the parts of self-defense that go beyond just fighting. Also, it's possible that many of the participants in self-defense seminars won't be used to physical contact, which is why takedowns and ground fighting rarely, if ever, show up in these types of seminar. Most of the techniques that I've seen taught in self-defense seminars end up being, what if someone grabs your wrist? Or, what if someone throws a single slow punch at your face and leaves their arm there? As part of this marketing ploy too, self-defense techniques taught at seminars have to feel good when a beginner applies them. You want them to feel like they've really learned something of value, otherwise they're not going to want to come back and sign on as a real student. For all of these reasons, the common denominator of techniques taught as self-defense can be incredibly low, and they rely on incredibly unlikely telegraphed attacks and absolutely no pressure testing. A compliant student folding over when a seminar participant uses an Aikido-style wrist lock will make that participant feel like they really know something effective, 
even if it's not really the best technique. And of course, the other big problem with seminar techniques is that the participants almost never practice them after those seminars are over. Karate, Kung Fu, and other similar martial arts are known for taking several years to master, and while the techniques themselves might not be that complicated, I think that any training that wants to make you a good fighter is going to have to take place over a long time. Some of the fastest paced fight training is military boot camps, and the US Army basic training lasts for 10 weeks at a minimum. Hand-to-hand -hand combat is only really focused on for the first five weeks from the information that I can find, but all 10 weeks comprise an intense regimen of physical exercise with recruits expected to be training for several hours a day, every day. If your civilian dojo were able to have students train for multiple hours a day, every day, it might take a little bit less time to gain proficiency in their martial arts. But if you're training twice a week, two hours at a time, for two years, you end up with about 400 hours of practice. That's more or less equivalent to six hours daily over the 10 weeks of basic training, not counting the fact that a civilian student has a lot more downtime in which to forget their techniques or grow soft. So if you try and learn a self-defense technique over a few weeks or months, you'll only really be getting about 10% of the practice that a recruit would, and that's not enough to be a competent fighter no matter how you look at it. But even this kind of sporadic training that we see in modern dojos is much better than what seminar participants get. One of the benefits of long-term practice is that it builds your fighting techniques into instinctive responses. While each technique might be relatively simple, it takes time to get used to doing them correctly, and even more time to train yourself so that they come out as a natural response when you're in a fight or in a self-defense situation. The reason why almost all self-defense techniques taught in seminars fail is because the people who learn them never practice them, and therefore don't really have a hope of applying them in real life. But since these techniques have to feel effective without that long period of training, they often fool people into thinking that they have learned something that's really practical. Now, so far we've only really focused on why seminar self-defense isn't good, not why women's self-defense is specifically bad. While women's self-defense techniques tend to be taught in seminars, there are some dojo owners that advertise their whole art as women's self-defense, or who consider themselves specifically to be gurus in women's techniques in particular. This is especially common in arts like Aikido, which pride themselves on techniques that don't rely on strength or physical size. Conversely, while seminars can have a lot of problems, there are plenty of martial arts schools that have been able to clear some of these hurdles, or at the very least make sure that their participants know that they've only really scratched the surface of proper self-defense. One of the articles in my sources talks about an LGBTQ self-defense class, where the teacher made sure to beat it into the attendees' heads over and over again that the techniques that they were learning were super unlikely to be useful unless they were practiced incredibly regularly, and even then they weren't going to turn someone into Kill Bill. So why does the worst stuff tend to get lumped into women's self-defense? I think that part of it is that people make a lot of really weird assumptions about women that don't get made when thinking about other groups and self-defense. The first and most obvious of these assumptions is that women are going to be shorter, lighter, and physically weaker than their attackers. Now, it is true that, on average, women are going to be shorter than men, and have less muscle mass, and have a harder time gaining muscle mass than men. However, there's a lot of individual variance among both women and men that really complicates trying to make any generalizations. There are plenty of women who are much taller than plenty of men, and obviously muscle mass and strength aren't going to be purely based on testosterone or estrogen, but also on whether they are training and the condition of their use. Interestingly enough, an article that I found while researching this video suggested that uh, female hormones like estrogen and progesterone can increase the recovery speed of muscles after aerobic exercise, and that testosterone increases muscle power output in anaerobic exercise. But there's clearly a lot of overlap between men and women, both in terms of size and in terms of physical ability. But of course, we're also still assuming that women will always be attacked by men. A lot of women's self-defense techniques seem to assume that a small, maybe physically capable, but not incredibly strong woman is being attacked by a large muscular man, or men, who want to sexually assault her. Now, this focus does make some sense, since that type of attack does happen, and would obviously be incredibly terrifying. But in terms of preventing sexual assault, we should consider which types of assaults are the most often to occur. First off, obviously, there are a portion of victims, around 6%, who are men. In one study, only about 37% of suspects were people who the victim didn't know or had only recently met, whereas 
Most of the suspects were someone known by the victim, including friends, relatives, partners or former partners, or even neighbors. Another study calculates that about 37.9% of assailants are strangers, and 18% are current or former intimate partners. Sexual assault can also take a number of different forms, with many assailants choosing to use drugs or alcohol, or other means of preventing resistance from their victims. The majority of these cases also take place either in the victim's home or in the assailant's home, not on the street. So if the goal of women's self-defense is to prevent sexual assault, you could argue that it should focus on prevention, such as recognizing intimate partner abuse or keeping your drinks from being drugged. When I went to Pride Fest in Seattle a few years ago, the general advice that was given to me was to never set your drink down, keep your drink at or above eye level at all times, and never let someone put their hand over your drink even if they're just reaching to shake your hand. These tips get given to anyone who might be at risk of this type of sexual assault, not just women, which is why they end up being more matter-of-fact and realistic than some of the women's self-defense techniques that I'm trying to criticize. But in terms of the broader idea of self-defense, women are also decently likely to be assaulted by other women, especially when it's physical assault that isn't sexual assault. The assumption that women will always be fighting against a much stronger male assailant seems to trick people into thinking that the pressure-tested techniques that boxing, BJJ, Muay Thai, and even some full-contact karate styles like Kudo and Kyokushin teach will suddenly stop working. Maybe a woman who's under five feet tall will have trouble landing a clean hook on a six foot five inch man, but if that kind of strike works in the ring, there's no reason why it wouldn't work on the street. Even if you're much weaker or smaller than your attacker, the principles of striking don't change, just the mismatch in your strength, height, and weight. So much of women's self-defense techniques relies on pressure points and small joint locks, two types of techniques that are almost impossible to pull off under even mild resistance. It makes sense that you would want techniques that could help to overcome strength differentials and that don't rely purely on throwing your weight around, but as anyone who practices a realistic martial art can tell you, there is no way to eliminate the advantages of strength and weight in fighting. Martial arts that try and bridge that gap effectively focus more on center of gravity and leverage, which, for instance, can allow some judo players to completely throw a resisting opponent without having to simply be stronger than them. And striking arts will often focus on areas of anatomical weakness, like the jaw or the livers, rather than the fingertip-style pressure points that some dimmak or chinna style techniques claim to be able to hit. Even if these pressure points did work, which is super debatable, what's going to be easier? Hitting a small point under someone's armpit, which is usually going to be covered by their arm, or landing a clean straight to someone's face. And what's going to be more likely on the street? Someone grabbing a perfect Aikido Ikkyo wrist lock, or shooting a simple double leg takedown? It's not like practical martial arts stop being practical when they're practiced by women. These techniques work regardless of if you're a man or a woman, as long as you have a human body. You're never going to be able to completely overcome size and strength differences, but you'll have a much better chance if you know fight techniques that work on people your own size, rather than relying on gimmicks like so much of women's self-defense does. So if you're a woman looking to try and keep yourself safe, just join a fight gym. If you can't fight off someone your own size, no amount of one-off techniques will save you in a live fight. And if you're teaching women self-defense, don't ever teach someone to lean their neck into a chokehold, or especially into a knife. Like, seriously, who the hell thought that was a good idea? You want to bleed out and die? That's how you bleed out and die. Thanks for watching this video, and don't forget to buy my book of secret skills to dominate in a street fight without ever touching your opponent. Guaranteed to keep you from getting stabbed or shot, or your money back. You just, you just gotta write me once you uh, have that situation happen. <sighs> All jokes aside, if you liked this video, then you'll probably like the videos in my sources, which take apart individual bullshit techniques. I especially recommend sticking around to the end of Ramsey Dewey's Top 22 Worst Women's Self-Defense Techniques, which made me laugh out loud, and then subscribe to his channel, which is something that I really should have done a long time ago. If you liked this video, though, please hit the button that says so, and maybe even leave me a comment letting me know the stupidest women's self-defense technique you've ever seen. My personal favorite bad advice was someone recommending that women soil themselves to make themselves less appealing. Uh, which, I guess if you can do that on command, that's super impressive. Um, if you want to see more of these videos, subscribe to this channel, ring the bell, you know, all the YouTube things that let you see my videos here, 
on YouTube, the place where I post videos. And uh, I've been the Goju Philosopher, and kick them in the nards.